Is one shock absorber just like the other? We'll look into the inner workings and talk about the differences. And how can it be that I as a mechanic can find out during analysis of the part that oil is leaking out and the shock absorber has become harder instead of softer? We'll clarify all that in this video. Reiner, today we would like to clarify, is one shock absorber just like the other? Are there any differences? If so, what are they? And how do I recognize them apart from the color? Yes, you're right. The color isn't the deciding factor, but what lies inside. We have two types of shock absorbers here. We see a yellow shock absorber here and a black one from us, a typical OE shock absorber. From the outside, they look almost the same. Absolutely. One thing is important, just take a look inside. What do the internals look like? There are two different systems, functional principles, a monotube system and a twin tube system. If we take a look at our sectional model at the front, we can see the technology that Bielstein pioneered. In 1954, we patented the world's first production monotube shock absorber. Our first major customer, none other than Mercedes. It's a monotube shock absorber, so it only has one tube. We see a separating piston here, we see our piston rod at the front and the working piston again. This valve with the spring washers where the oil flows through. You can see it a little better here at the front with this functional model. This is our working piston and the piston rod. Here we have our oil chamber where the oil flows or is pressed through the working piston. This is our separating piston and behind it we have our gas. That means we have a monotube gas pressure shock absorber and the gas has two different tasks. One task is to compress the oil column so that the shock absorber does not suffer cavitation so that the damping characteristic remains stable. The other thing is that it has to absorb the volume of the piston rod. When the shock absorber is working, the piston rod is pressed into the tube head and the volume has to go somewhere. Eventually the shock absorber takes that up and the separating piston moves accordingly. This is the monotube tube shock absorber. Then there is another type of construction which is much older. This is perhaps over a century old, the twin tube shock absorber. Again, it depends on the internals. This twin tube shock absorber, which you can see very clearly cut open at the front, has a second tube. If we have two tubes, there is also a compensation chamber and it is actually a simple operating principle. The piston rod is pressed in, the oil is displaced at the bottom to the bottom valve and enters the compensation chamber. That's, that's what it looks like. However, the shock absorber itself does not work independently of position. This means that we can now see the oil column here at the front completely filled. We can also clearly see how this volume compensation takes place. But if I were to turn this shock absorber more than 45 degrees, for example, I would also have cavitation again. The air bubbles that get in there. Exactly. Then the oil column is not completely in the inner tube. This means that it only works vertically up to a maximum inclination of 45 degrees. So as a mechanic, it's important to know what shock absorber is in front of me in order to be able to get to the source of the problem more quickly if there are noises or problems. Exactly. We all know about the twin tube shock absorber or the shock absorber when it loses oil. It becomes softer or the valve discs are worn out, etc. But then there's another phenomenon. There is a type of shock absorber that becomes harder, tighter. This means that the piston rod no longer goes in properly. This is the monotube shock absorber. Imagine it like this. When we finally have our oil here, the gas here, we lose oil, and the separating piston goes up here, and at some point, the piston rod touches the separating piston. This gives us a loud knocking noise. And the piston rod doesn't go in properly anymore either. The car's ride becomes harder. And from the outside, as a mechanic, how can I tell if it's installed on the car? It can be difficult. So, I do a test drive. I experience a symptom and then I look at the system. If I can't interpret it exactly, then I look at this shock absorber. Here I can see the outer shape of the shock absorber is slightly different. The tube is tapered. It may well be that this is not a problem at all, because it has another tube inside, which is the working chamber. This means that it's a twin tube shock absorber. The monotube shock absorber is always cylindrical in shape because the working piston travels through the entire tube. 
This is the rear axle. What about the front axle and the McPherson strut? We also have various possibilities. The McPherson strut is designed in such a way that it also takes over steering forces and duties. This means that all forces acting on the suspension during cornering, etc. are transported via the piston rod. That's why we have a very stable, very thick piston rod here. At the same time, however, we try to take quite a lot of force away from the piston rod. That means we have the monotube upside down system, where we turn the shock absorber completely around. What you see up here is the damper pipe, it is not the piston rod. If I understand you correctly, then I take this, turn the whole thing around, and this is what the interior looks like here? Yeah, you can say it that way. Maybe I can hold it up next to it. That means, of course, there would be no eye, but it would be screwed down here. We have the piston rod down here, at the same time the pressure or bump stop, which is very important. And then we have two plain bearings. That means that one would be here in the front and the other would be there to ensure that there is a guide so that all the large forces are transmitted. And this is what the whole thing looks like. But if we now have oil loss, of course we always look at the top of the seal package on such a shock absorber. What's that look like? But with a monotube shock absorber, it's like this. The oil can't come out of the top because there's actually only the two. We have this piston rod down here and this sealing package is close by. This means that the oil would not be visible at all. This means you always have to know exactly what kind of system it is. And if there is something, what could it be? These plain bearings lubricate this tube with a grease. That's why they're called plain or sliding bearings. And then it's like this. If a slight emulsion comes out of the top, many people call technical support and say, yes, it's leaking oil. Is that all right? Can that be the case? Is it assembly oil or anything else? No, it's just this grease that sometimes comes out easily. So you can already see that it depends on the detail whether you can recognize a twin tube, a monotube, or which damage pattern and what I can conclude from that. When I go to my workshop now, I see more and more testers, electronics. What about the shock absorbers where the cable is attached? These are the active or semi-active systems. Here at the front we have the passive ones, which means that the characteristic setting is actually predefined. The settings can vary, which means that the vehicle needs or gives information and then the shock absorber can become softer or firmer just as it is needed at the moment. I then check this electronic system with diagnostic tools. I simply go through this fault memory and look at the whole thing, but it's not a 100% test. So here, it's really like this. I check the electronic system. How about the cable? Do I have a broken cable? Do I have too much contact resistance? I can't check for wear at all. That means I have to look closely at how this shock absorber works. Is the electronic system okay? If it's okay, but the driving behavior is still bad, it is quite possible that we simply have normal wear and tear. Because shock absorbers are replaceable service parts. In addition, it's interesting to know where this valve is located, or how does it work. And it has to be said that this valve is controlled electronically. It has to react very quickly, of course, and it opens and closes a bypass. In other words, you can simply say, is an additional bypass open? I can simply take out such a component at the front. We call all the electronic systems in our catalog Damptronic. At the front, you would have the normal working piston with all the spring washers that are here at the front. This is our valve. And then we have another possibility to open a bypass aperture. This means that a second oil flow enters here at the front and then goes out here at the top where the valve is open. There is more oil flow, so you have a softer damper setting. And of course, it's very interesting that we work with different flows with identification fields nowadays. This means that we don't just open and close, but have a very wide range of characteristic damper settings that we can play, so to speak, as the car needs it. Another thing is that you can usually tell that we have an electronic suspension that the valves are mounted on the outside. That means that here we see this valve on the outside, which is the same. We also have a bypass here, which means that we open an oil flow somewhere and then have a softer characteristic damper setting. This has to work continuously, relatively quickly, as quickly as possible. This is the technology that is called an active or semi-active system, for example. 
And then we have another one, which is here in the middle. What's it all about? This is a very interesting example. It's a shock absorber, but I can't really see anything. From the outside, it looks like a normal shock absorber, but the technology is interesting. In other words, what's in it? We call these systems dampmatic. These are the comfort valves, so that means this shock absorber has an additional valve. You have to imagine it like changing lanes when driving a car. That's where the whole system comes from. The lane change is known as the moose test. I have to swerve, and then the damping force needs to be increased extremely quickly. We have a dampmatic control piston here at the front and have a bypass here at the front. It's difficult to see, but there is a bypass. And here at the front is this bore. Imagine it like this. I'll just put it down for this purpose. I'm driving my car. I have a soft characteristic damper setting. I'm driving slowly and I have no problem at all. I'm driving a bit faster and the shock absorber is working a bit. This little piston always moves up and down a bit. That's called the comfort valve, so the car is really comfortable and I don't notice every stone. Driving a bit faster and I have a situation where I have to swerve. That means I swerve, the car moves accordingly, I have a fast, large stroke. That's why it's called an amplitude selective damper. And when it dips, this control piston closes a bypass. At this moment, the shock absorber is tight, safe, and afterwards, after the situation, when the car is in a normal position again, it's soft again. That's why it's called a comfort valve. The thing is, in the workshop, I go to the suspension tester and I see a normal shock absorber in a new car, it might only show me damping values of 30 to 60 percent or whatever. Thus, a value that is far below 100 percent. That's why you have to know what's in there in the first place. It can't show 100% because the suspension tester would have to have an extreme stroke and then it would still be too soft between, let's say, bottom dead center and top dead center. And that's already the core message of this video. Not all shock absorbers are the same. As a mechanic, I really need to know what shock absorber I'm dealing with in order to carry out a fault analysis correctly. Monotube, twin tube, how do I deal with electronic shock absorbers? And I know Reiner has a lot more knowledge that he'd like to share. Are you interested in gaining access to this knowledge? Why don't you go to the Bielstein website, go to the workshop portal, and get in touch with Reiner and his colleagues from the Academy. Take part in the online seminar or in the present seminar.